two, one. Good morning, everyone. This is Mayor Pro Tem Wesley Hudson calling Prosperity and Livability Committee to order. In chambers with me today is Council Member Michael Holmes and Council Member Cyril Jefferson. We have four items on our agenda this morning, and we will start with a resolution to make the city of High Point a B City USA affiliate. This will start. Robbie, Robbie's going to. Robbie Stone's going to. So this is kind of deja vu, I guess we'll say. Yeah. Um, so you all have already heard about this. Uh, it's coming B City. We want to keep this short and brief, unless you just ask for more information. Um, we went through the presentation, uh, and we actually had created a, a resolution. Uh, that was given to us and we pared it down a little bit because it was so long it's almost two full pages so we sent this you all approved it we sent this in to b city and they said we can't take that we need we need our standard resolution so basically it goes back in there's some additions i think that rebecca's given that to you just some additional highlighted items in that and we're just bringing this back forward to you to um, ask for approval for us to um, uh, transition and, and be accepted as b city usa uh, Rebecca's here. If you do have some more information or anybody has some questions, maybe you didn't um, uh, hear the last presentation about this, we'll be more than happy to let her uh, talk through that in more detail. Any questions? I think we were all here last time, but any questions? We are. I just refresh my memory, like in terms of us being a B city, what does that mean for us? Like, what does that mean for the city of High Point? Like, sure. So, um, we'd like to focus on this project because. Um, the, the overall mission of B City USA is to bring to uh, people's attention and awareness that we, we need to have, protect our pollinators because mm -hmm. if we don't do that, then that uh, impacts our food crop for the future. Yes, sir. And so we're just joining with many other municipalities, communities across the U.S. to say that um, we're going to educate folks on the importance of our pollinators, mm -hmm. which we do that a lot and keep High Point beautiful anyway. So it just folded in so naturally. Um, it's a, it cost uh, $500 a year for us to join. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> on top of that, that's really, it, 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 like I said, it just folded in so naturally that, that we said, let's, let's take this to you folks and, and see what you think. So if I wanted to take up beekeeping, like you guys would train me to do that? So it's a, it's a little different. That's an excellent question. So we focus on the native bees, oh, whereas okay. beekeepers uh, focus on the, the honey bee that came from Europe. Oh, okay. So, um, but I know someone. Yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I, know, I know a guy. <laughs> and so, but hopefully we can um, educate as we do, we go into schools and such, start educating everyone, but especially kids, and to not be afraid of bees, yeah, yeah. and to explain their, their benefits, and, and then we continue to, to grow as a community in our knowledge and understanding. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, I will entertain a motion. So moved. Uh, second. A motion and a second on the floor for approval. Can I ask a question before we, Absolutely. Before we go to vote? Um, one of the things I, I recall us discussing, uh, we were trying to figure out if there was going to be some kind of financial implication of this. And I, I felt like what you all came back to us in terms of when we were talking about some of the adjustments we had to do on chemicals was that the price change, we didn't know exactly what it would be, but perhaps it would be nominal. Um, can, can someone confirm? I, I feel like that was a part of our discussion. I'm gonna pull I just Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'm going to pull Robbie back up. Yes, we did look at that. We felt like if there is any change, it's going to be very minimal. Um, the, a lot of the chemicals that we're currently using uh, were not harmful to, to the bees. Um, you know, there's, there's always going to be something out there, so we'll just have to keep a focus on that and, and work with our staff to keep that up front and, and foremost when they do select chemicals and are looking for other chemicals in the future. Yeah. And, and to be clear, I, I totally think it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, right. I think it's totally worth the investment, even if it's, I think at, at least knowing what that is and um, us being able to be aware that, you know, we're making that kind of investment, again, however nominal it may be, right. um, to have this kind of designation. It's very important for our city, uh, for our environment, for food security, uh, as well as for the aesthetics of our city as well, which right. all things are very important. And we had extensive conversation with our Parks and Rec group too, because they probably use more chemicals than we do. Mm -hmm. and, and the ones that we're currently using, um, are, everything is, is 
pretty much in line with what, where we need to be to, to be a, a supporter here. Um, there are some chemicals that are used in very, very minimal in very unique situations that may not align with this. So, so that's something that we're all looking at to see, make sure in that we're keeping that at a minimal use, but also are there any, is there anything else that we could utilize in the future that would not um, um, go against this, this resolution here? Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, one more question. Uh, I know that um, there are certain um, you know, plants and flowers that are natural pollinator attractors. Uh, in some of our natural areas, city areas, are we looking at maybe planting some of this, using some of this space as, as uh, you know, planting areas for, for, attract, for those flowers that attract the pollinators? Uh, is that something that we're considering? Sure. So we have uh, discussed that um, and we had a conversation with um, Winston-Salem. They are also B city. That's something they're doing. We're also in, um, gone ahead and uh, been in discussion with the folks over at the Piedmont Environmental Center. You may know they have their native plant sale every yeah, yeah. year. Um, they're putting plants aside for us for this purpose. We're going to be looking to um, do some plantings in <clears throat> certain areas. So yes, sir, we're right in line with your thinking. Excellent. We've also had discussions with Parks and Rec about Good. doing some of our rights of way with Good. natural natural pollinators as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any any further Thank questions? You. If not, there's a motion on the on the uh, floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. And if anyone would like to learn about beekeeping, <laughs> there just <laughs> happens to be a beginner bee class at the High Point Library Saturday at ten o'clock. <laughs> Called by right. yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item, uh, I assume, is also Robbie. Uh, no, it is not. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We're going to talk about the high point yard waste going green. Hallelujah. I, I even wore my green shirt so that I was <laughs> matching the presentation. Oh, do you know how to get it to? Oh, there we go. Oh, here we go. So we're going to continue on this path of livability within our city. Yes. Um, so what I'm here, I'm Melinda King. I'm the Assistant Public Services to Director. And what I'm here today is to request a change to our current solid waste ordinance, which will impact both our Environmental Services Department, which is collection, and then our landfill um, department, which is disposal. Um, but we're asking to change the um, allowance of plastic bags in our yard waste disposal and um, eliminate that completely from our um, ordinance. So I am going to give you guys some background about how we even got to this point. Um, as I said, it does impact two of our divisions, but all of our yard waste goes to the Ingleside Compost Facility. Um, that facility opened in 1993. It's approximately 32 acres. It's a type one composting facility, which means that we accept untreated, unpainted, and unglued wood waste, and yard waste, which is leaves, grass, brush, and limb. Um, the products that we are able to produce from that and sell back to the public are wood mulch, leaf mulch, topsoil, and compost. This particular issue impacts our compost and our topsoil the most. So since 1993, we've learned a lot about our collection system. We've learned a lot about our disposal system and, and how to make compost. And so the current concerns that are facing us and, and implementing this change are collection, and that relates to safety, lack of limitations, and enforcement of our current ordinance. And then through disposal, our composting process, um, real estate limitations and costs associated with that, and then the environmental impacts um, of allowing the plastic in our system. So with the collection concerns, um, safety is obviously a huge issue for the solid waste industry. Um, it's the seventh most dangerous uh, profession out there, and the single most dangerous profession for our city employees is working within the right-of-way. So our yard waste collection is um, obviously all done in the right-of-way, and we've got a driver and two employees, workers, that are on the back and hand load everything into the back of the truck. So um, as they collect this yard waste, we can tend to see lifting injuries from dealing with the plastic bags. Um, if there are a significant amount of plastic bags, then we have extended times on the street itself as they load the materials in. Um, another issue that they can face is as it sits out there, depending on what time of day it's picked up, they can um, heat up and then those bags can get very hot and they're difficult to handle. So as they're loading them in, that's, that's a struggle for them. So um, currently we have no limitations on the number of bags that we allow an, an, a resident to put out. 
So as you can see in that picture on the far right, we can sometimes have up to 50 to 100 bags that they have to stop and load at one spot. Um, we often think of yard waste in residential areas, but the fact is we do have residential locations along Skeet Club, Johnson Street, University, and so the more we allow a resident to have, the longer it takes for these guys to be out there. They're trying to be efficient, they're trying to load as quickly as possible, so you just run that risk of a potentially a, a bigger uh, lifting injury. Um, in our current policy, the um, clear bags are allowed at curbside collection. You can bring any type of bag to the Ingleside compost facility itself. And um, just quickly, what I forgot to mention is curbside collection is um, available for any resident. Um, at the Ingleside compost facility, uh, a resident can drop off for free. Uh, commercial and um, outside residents can bring for a price. But when they bring it to the facility, they can bring it in any type of plastic bag. But our policy for curbside is clear bags. But as you can see in the picture above, we have trouble enforcing that. And um, that becomes an issue when in like the, sec the far right picture there you see, they'll have a mix of bags. So you can't just pick up the clear and leave the black bag. So yet again, we have guys that are out there trying to figure out what's exactly in this bag. Should I load it? And you know that's just leading to more time on the street as well. So our disposal concerns. Um, so here's just a brief overview of what the composting process is. Um, you can see in the diagram on the left, um, we either have the yard waste come in through a truck or from an individual. Um, they dump at the facility, and then we put that um, product into a tub grinder, which is that um, equipment there on the right-hand side, the red piece of equipment. So what they do is they load that up with a big claw, put it in the tub grinder. It is not using um, teeth like you would think. It's more of um, just a, a turning motion. Uh, and so it's not really made for bags. It's made to grind up wood, leaves, that kind of stuff. Once it's um, shredded, it then goes into what is called windrows. Um, and there's a whole process to how you you know create compost, but you have to create a certain um, yeah, yeah, and then you know it, have to, it has to sit and heat and water and all of that is what creates the biological process. Once it gets, they have to turn it, once it gets to the actual curing process is then when we put it through the screener and that's the equipment there uh, on the bottom right. So typically in the composting process, you're screening out maybe large pieces of dirt, um, maybe pieces of wood that didn't ground, get ground up well. What we're screening out is plastic bags. And so all of that plastic is then sitting there on the site just waiting um, to be moved off site. And so what we would like to do is get rid of the plastic bags. Ultimately, whatever screened out could go right back into the composting process again, and then we're a zero waste facility. So um, growth has occurred since 1993 in High Point. Um, in 1993, we were about 70,000 people. In 2021, we were about 114,000. So that's about a 60% growth. So we're seeing more yard waste coming into the facility. We're limited on space. So as we grow, we're gonna continue to see that, that number increase. In 2017, 15.5 uh, tons um, were coming inbound. In 2022, we had over 20,000 tons inbound. inbound. Um, like I spoke about before, you know, we have equipment costs due to these bags. Both pieces of those equipment were never made to um, work with plastic bags. So they can get bound up in there, they can take the machine down. Anytime it goes down, we have to fix it. And plus that's product we're not able to make when the equipment is down. Um, it costs us about $50,000 a year to transport whatever is rejected out of the screener over to the Kersey Valley landfill. And although we um, you know, cover the material as it's transported, there's always a chance that those items can fly out as it's transported. Um, and then, of course, whatever we bring into the landfill reduces the airspace that we have available to the paying customers. So not only are we losing airspace, we're also losing revenue at the landfill that we could see. It's about $600,000 um, for airspace per acre. So we, we're losing significant amount of money just putting this reject material in there. Um, and just to give you a quick, the, the, the picture up there is a picture of the screener, and then off to the left is the pile of plastic bags that have been screened out. So it takes up a significant amount of real estate. Um, so this is just an aerial of the property itself in yellow. As you can see, there's nowhere for us to expand this facility. We have residential above and below. Ingleside Drive is um, what fronts the property. 
And then behind the property, we have um, easements and then a sewer line that runs along the creek. And with buffer rules, we can't expand anyway. So we are limited to that 32 acre site. Um, so whatever real estate we're using, holding these bags until we can transport is real estate that we could use for additional material if we were a zero waste recycling facility, which contributes to more product for us to be able to sell. So the biggest concern here are the environmental impacts of the plastic bags. So single use plastics are what people are utilizing. Um, out of 100 billion single use plastics, only 1% are recycled. Uh, obviously, there's fossil fuel emissions with the production of the plastic bags, the uh, time that the trucks load the plastic bags, its transportation to the facility, and then back over to Kersey Valley. Um, and then the ultimate concern is the contaminants in the organic material that we sell. <coughs> so although most of it's screened out, unfortunately, um, the process of composting is using heat. So as those plastic bags sit in that heat, they break down those toxins into the material that we turn around and sell. So even if we are able to get most of it out, those toxins have already been incorporated into the compost that we ultimately sell. And then that ultimately devalues the product. We have a great price on compost. We certainly, if we have a more valuable product, could look at upping that at some point. Um, so this is just some pictures of what we have out there, and I've got some product for you. But on the left-hand side is what we call the bag pile. Um, so you can see with the claw, they just pick that up and they put that into the tub grinder. What you have on the right-hand side is what the windrow, um, and that's in this first bag. So you can see the plastic bags there. Um, pass it along for me. And you can see how um, much material is in there plastic-wise as it actually goes through the composting process. Um, and then this is a short video, I hope it'll play, um, but this is also to show you that although we screen most of the material out, on a windy day we can't determine where that material might go. So although we screen it and we hope it, you know, get most of it out, it could ultimately fly around on a windy day and get into the other products like wood mulch um, and then the topsoil and other items that we have out there. So we do have fencing set up to try and keep it from exiting the facility itself but that's not always guaranteed as well. Um, and I do have um, a bag here of the final product, which is what we sell. And although the pieces are small, there's still a lot. And as it sits in your yard or as it travels, the fines, the small fines are what gonna be at the bottom. And then ultimately those plastics and wood pieces are gonna come up to the top. Mm -hmm. While you're sitting on that, yeah. take notice of the size of the pile. Right, I mean, these yes. piles are 10 feet tall. These are, and, yeah. and go on for a, a, quite a way. <laughs> I mean. Okay, so this is something that is, you know, happening nationwide, um, but I did want to provide you with some um, local municipalities and what they're doing. So City of Winston-Salem, the Town of Kernersville, and the City of Burlington all provide yard waste carts. Winston-Salem does provide um, a yard waste cart, but you have to purchase a sticker every year to be in compliance for your yard waste to be picked up. They do not allow paper bags or plastic bags, but they do have the loose leaf collection similar to what we have, which is through the vacuum process in the fall. Um, City of Greensboro just two weeks ago took to their council to eliminate the use of personal um, 32 gallon um, containers, go to yard waste carts, eliminate the plastic bags, uh, allow paper bags, and they also have the loose leaf collection. They are not able to move forward with the um, change right now because they don't have the budget for any new yard waste carts because what they're gonna be doing is changing their recycling to a different color and then using the recycling as the yard waste cart. So they're hoping to in, in, um, put that into their system next year. Yeah. Um, the city of Raleigh uses yard waste carts. They do not allow plastic bags. They do allow paper bags, but they have that limitation of 15 mm -hmm. um, bags. And then they do up that to 20 during the um, fall leaf season, but they also have loose leaf collection. And then the city of Charlotte has um, personal 75 pound limited containers. Um, they don't allow plastic bags. They do allow pla paper bags, but they do not have a loose leaf collection uh, in the fall. And so what our recommendations are is to um, eliminate the plastic bags from the system, um, allow individuals to continue to use those yard waste carts, uh, paper bags limited up to 20, and then uh, continue with the loose leaf collection in the fall. At Ingleside, we would allow individuals to bring paper bags. They can bring items in reusable containers and then just empty them on site. We could also allow them to bring plastic bags that they empty themselves, but I would have concerns of that just from you know, contamination or forgetfulness. Um, 
but this, this picture up here is um, a demonstration that we did on site at uh, Ingleside. They filled some um, paper bags about a week before Easter. And as you know, it was quite wet and rainy that time. So it sat out, this is two weeks after the fact. So these, these are pictures two weeks later. And as you can see, they've held up um, in the weather. Uh, the guys, the yard waste crews said they were easy to pick up because they hold their shape and their form. And they said they were much easier to handle loading into the equipment itself. So timeline and implementation, um, we would like to make this effective July 1st. We would provide a grace period for residents until August 31st, and then start full enforcement September 1st. Um, as we go through that grace period, we would leave notes for those so that they understand, hey, you know, we're, we've changed this process, but then as of September 1st, we would no longer pick up. We would still leave a note, but we wouldn't take it. Um, implementation would happen through, P, you know, communication with PIO to push this out through social medias and other communication um, efforts, bill stuffers May through September, press releases to the local news outlets, uh, direct mailing with a postcard of a reminder of the change July, August, and September, and then of course partnering with home improvement stores to ensure that they have the bags. The picture um, previously was a bag from just a local hardware store here, so they already are carrying them. We just want to make sure that they're carrying the right amount once we, if we make this switch. So, are there any questions with that? Uh, do, is there any plans to budget to maybe send um, residents maybe a, a couple of bags to get them started uh, on the transition? I don't know if that's... We had um, reached out to Raleigh and Charlotte and talked with them um, about that. And um, Charlotte did provide bags. They, they had, okay, you can come pick up bags as long as we have them. Mm -hmm. Raleigh did not, and they recommended not doing that. Not they doing said that, that that was a very difficult process, and, and they just didn't want to get in the Certainly. habit of, oh, well, I didn't get mine, or I didn't hear right. about it in time. So we would prefer not to do that. Um, we have talked about you know, maybe potentially giving away the first 100 people a yard waste card or, or something just to, because ultimately the yard waste card is the best option for us and, and that's gonna be the cheapest op option for the property owner because they can just reuse it yeah. over and over again. Cool. And you can put loose leaves in your yard waste container. Yes, oh. yes, absolutely. I and find, I and I believe Damon has there. come up with a process if you just keep yeah. packing it down into that container. <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> That's what kids are for. <laughs> Is there any appetite for uh, getting rid of paper bags as well, totally? I mean, ultimately, we would love to not have any sort of bag in the process and then just go to yard waste yeah. carts, but, uh, you know, that obviously is going to fall on the um, individuals to purchase a cart. Um, it's still going to have to be, you know, they, they hand load um, wood debris and stuff like that. So it doesn't eliminate the ability to go fully automated, but it certainly would make things much faster and, and much easier and a much cleaner product. How much when we you see going? this presentation, sorry, Monica, yeah. just as a follow up. When we see this presentation at full council, this slide that's got um, the local comparisons. Yes. Can we get High Point on there uh, on the bottom of the top, just so we can see High Point in that same grid? Okay. Comparing to those, because I with with our current place. ordinance or what we would with, like with, to see with our current, and you can put in parentheses right next to it in green okay. the recommendation. Sure. So absolutely. then we can see how High Point currently stacks, and then right like literally in the same cell in parentheses in green or whatever. Right. We get to see what it looks like if we go with the recommendation. Okay. Because on some of this, I, I, I'm recalling through just some of these conversations where we stand on some of this, but I can't even remember, like, in terms of yard waste carts, I know my house has one. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming I bought it, and I don't know, I guess. <laughs> I just, I know I have one. But that was my question. How much are the yard waste carts? So, as uh, for, our, for our next budget, we're requesting to go up to $70. Right now, they're $57, but, but we're paying more for the carts than we're actually receiving. So, we're requesting those to be $70, but it's a one-time fee. Yeah, it's a one-time fee, and yeah. you get it. I mean, you and that's it, yeah. Better, yeah. And you can have yes. up to two yard waste carts. I believe. Yeah, and it's so. buying an extra cart yeah, yeah. as well. I love, we love our yard yeah. waste Yeah, cart. well, and we, we, we use ours too, and I, I guess, yeah, so if we could see it, because I think it would show City of High Point, yard waste cart, yes, yearly fee, plastic bag, yes, but then parentheses would say no, okay. and then paper bag, however you guys want to do it there. Okay. 
um, I guess yes, but limit 15, uh, yes, 20, yeah, 20 what yeah. you guys are mm -hmm. saying. So if we could see that, I think that helps. I think also, I, I see here where you all sort of talked about, like, like I love the way you all broke it down in terms of us seeing the real estate, the Ingleside area, and knowing that, seeing the environmental impacts, um, seeing the real estate and costs and some of that. And I guess if there's, whenever we get to it, just recognizing um, some of the pain points that residents are going to have, mm -hmm. if we can be upfront about knowing those, it, yeah. it makes it much easier okay. for us to communicate. I know you guys are going to include that in some of your yeah. communications that go out to say, right, well, we right. recognize that this has these issues and requires this, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the pro to con cost benefit analysis here. Okay. I know you use better language than that, yeah. Jerron, but it, it just just something that sort of speaks to the fact that we recognize the pain point. Right. But here's a very clear list of all the upside. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I, I'm, I'm hearing, right, it's, you know, folks are going to have to adjust what they're used to doing. Folks are going to have to not use plastic bags. Maybe someone says, you know, I don't have paper bags or whatever, but it's good to know what those pain points are. And then very, very concisely, environmental, like everything you said on current issues, environmental there's so many extra costs attached to this that does it. There's a safety and all that stuff. So that right. way we can just see it clear side by side. It is easier, I think, also as a full council to weigh out pros versus cons when we see them together. Okay. And and Eric, thank or graciously let me know that um, plastic bags are about 20 cents less mm -hmm. than paper bags, mm -hmm. but we feel that they actually fit more material in the paper yeah. bag. So it kind of works out to be a wash. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So if, and, and I think a lot of people are going to be happy not to have to use the plastic bags because I've had some complaints like that they've cleaned up and now they have to put it in the plastic bag. So that brings up another question. So if they don't have a cart mm -hmm. and they're not going to put it in the plastic bag, can they, how do they put it out? Like, can they bring it with wheelbarrows and just dump it on the side? No, it would all either would have, have to be, to be in, in a paper bag or the yard waste cart, or okay. they could load it up and take it to Ingleside themselves. Okay, I got yeah. you. Uh, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 yes. But, but leaves only. <laughs> like branches and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Cut, cut down shrubs that they're cleaning right. up. Right. Yeah, I got you. But not like yard clippings, not like. No, it's like, just leaves, leaves during the, the leaf, leaf collection. So like yes. leaves, if I trim a tree or and you, you can currently you can bind those up in a certain length with twine and they pick those up as well okay. so okay. anything else no all right do is this something to vote on or is this just to go to full council if we vote on this will it go to a, a consent agenda and go to full council yes sir that it? then I'll, I'll entertain a motion i make a motion second there's a motion and a second on the floor any discussion if not all in favor Aye. Uh, opposed. That motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Great presentation. And, and, and again, I'd be interested in that at some point, not that I'm trying to change things too quickly, but I, I, I think we can have the appetite to get away from paper bags too at some point. I think, yeah. I think the environmental impact is big enough. Um, and I think it's important enough. And I think looking at some of these local municipality comparisons tells us that folks are doing it. Um, and it's okay, right? It's not not ruining things we can do it um but i guess for now we take steps right baby steps yeah. and then come back and revisit <laughs> mm -hmm. and you also you don't realize how big this issue is until you sure. think you know forty-five thousand households with one bag of pieces right. Forty-five thousand bags and if you have never been out to ingleside you don't yeah. realize how this is this is an issue so thank you for thank you for uh, hit, hitting this one head on and the next one I've waited a long time to to, <laughs> to bring to you. Greg Venable, please. <laughs> this is our improvements on crosswalks. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can I get this to pull up? I'll just um, start with, I'm Greg Venable, Director of Transportation, City of High Point. Um, as you guys are aware, we have a uh, study going on for North Main Street. So we uh, contracted with Kimley Horn and Associates back in December of last year. So uh, just to give you a brief update, we had our kickoff meeting in January. 
of this year. Uh, they're currently in the uh, data collection phase, so they're out there collecting uh, traffic counts, doing land use assessment, things like that. So we'll be slowly getting that information back. Uh, we'll have some public comment periods, uh, public meetings over the summer, um, and then a city council workshop probably in September uh, of this year, and then uh, council presentation uh, with the full comprehensive uh, list of recommendations for uh, the section of Main Street from Lexington down to Church Street. So if you guys remember, there was a, a three-phase approach. So we have um, all of Main Street from Lexington down to US 2970 interchange at South Main Street. Uh, the first phase is to Church Avenue. The second phase will go to Russell. And then the third phase will go down to the interchange. So um, we'll uh, move forward with that. And hopefully we'll get some good recommendations out of that for uh, like I said, looking at, at Main Street and how we want to see that in the future, what kind of pedestrian improvements, safety improvements um, that we'll have going forward. So, can, can you say those three segments again? Sure. I, I was looking at the presentation and didn't see it. What yep. are those three segments? So the first one will be from Lexington to Church. Okay. Church to Russell will be the second. Okay. And then Russell to the interchange at US 2970, Business 85 on South Main Street. Yeah, and I, I recall us talking about this, I guess just from my own sort of digestion again. We're not looking at anything north of Lexington, right? Yeah. Correct. This study does not look at north of Lexington right now. Yeah, it goes just a little bit. So you will include that inter intersection of Lexington with the study, but uh, no further north than that. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So is this just the? I guess this is the PDF version of that. So. But can I make a comment? And this is just my thought because yeah. I'm not in uh, transportation. So anyway, but just. What I kind of think is going to end up happening is once we do something okay. from oh, Lexington to whatever, and people even further north start taking alternate routes, you're going to exactly. see a little better. bit of a difference. That makes sense. I really feel that way because, point, so anyway. Thank you for that. That's Can point. I get a job in transportation? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Can I'm you drive a bus? <laughs> <laughs> Can you drive a bus? Yeah. Can you drive a bus? Uh, oh, drive that a would bus. be scary. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have to be on that side. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't know if that's any. Then you have to deal with us. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, what we've done with Kimley Horn, so they're doing the study. We have uh, contacted them to give us some uh, interim improvements or some recommendations to how we can move forward with more safety, uh, pedestrian safety improvements at the Brown Truck Crosswalk there at Hillcrest Play. So um, basically, we want to touch on some of those recommendations. Uh, through, through this presentation and let you guys, uh, you know, we've, we've made some recommendations on the ones we think would work and, and what we think will fit and then, uh, but there are a list of them we'll go through. Um, so basically looking at the existing treatments out there, uh, we currently have the high visibility crosswalk with that striping there across the main street. We have the, the RRFB, which is the rectangular rapid flashing beacon in place um, with the pedestrian warning signs at the crosswalk location. We also have, it's not listed here, but we do have those about 100 uh, yards ahead of the crosswalk as well. So those pedestrian uh, warning signs are ahead of the, the crosswalk on both the north side and south side uh, of the crossing. We have the, um, the end median, which have, they, you know, being in the median, they get knocked down some, so we've had to replace those, but the actual yield to pedestrian sign uh, there at the crosswalk. Uh, we have the detectable warnings at the ramps as well. Um, we have the enhanced surface, so we have the, the um, stamp crosswalk and then the color treatment as well. We have the overhead flashings, which are push button activated, and then the advanced uh, yield markings that are painted on Main Street itself. There's just a, an overview, a picture there looking at the, uh, the crosswalk from above existing conditions. So this is looking north. Uh, if you're heading north, I'm sorry, the top picture there looking at the crosswalk and then heading south down uh, looking at it. You can see the, the yield markings there on the pavement in front of the crosswalk at both of those locations. So we're discussing interim improvements. So uh, there are several options here. So um, one of the big things or, or most inexpensive or one of the least uh, expensive treatments is enhanced lighting. That's something that we can do fairly easily. I've looked out there, I've um, been out there several times at night and uh, there is lighting in place, but it doesn't hurt to enhance that lighting. So additional street lights uh, in the location of that crosswalk would be a good idea. And that's something that we would recommend. Um, and enhance the existing RRFB signs. So you see the signs there. So basically it's double posting those signs. So right now it's just, as you're traveling down, uh, if you're going southbound on Main Street, you have the sign on your side. And there's nothing on the other side, right? You have the sign facing the northbound yeah. traffic. So basically double posting that on each side of the post 
so that it's, you have flashing lights on both sides of the street, not just one side of the street, as well as the overhead. So that's, uh, that's one that we would recommend as well. You see the cost there, um, you know, ten dollars to $25,000, depending on the uh, cost of the product at the time. Uh, another uh, recommendation that uh, they came up with was putting flexible bollards within the median out there. Um, this is something that we would not recommend just because it's a maintenance issue. Um, I'm not sure what kind of benefit we would get uh, having those bollards out there in place and then just continually maintaining those that get knocked down uh, quite often. So that would be something we, we would not recommend. Uh, concrete median, refuge, refuge island uh, with detectable warnings. Um, again, this is something that relatively inexpensive that can be done uh, without too much, uh, too much work out there. Uh, this is something we would recommend. This is similar to, um, we have this type of, uh, if you know on Brentwood Street, we have a, a mid-block crossing out there. We actually put a median in and out there at, at that crosswalk, well, at that crosswalk to you just should, a you safe, Brentwood? safe island. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said Brentwood. Yeah, there's one at Brentwood. On the, um, gosh, I can't remember the address now, but we, there was a business that located out there. Uh, I'm not sure if they're still using it as it was intended, but they had uh, offices on both sides of the street. This is several years ago. We installed a, a mid block crossing, put a median in out there at that time. Past 85. Yes. Not, but, but before you get to Fairfield. Yes, and like that. yep, in that segment there. Kind of near where I think Fox 8 is at, right? Right, just, just south of that, yeah. Just south of that, okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we have that currently. That's something that uh, yeah, can be done, like I said, uh, pretty simple, simply. Um, also, we have here, we have the flashing lights ahead, overhead right now, uh, that's on kind of a span wire. Another recommendation would be to replace that with the RFB flashing uh, mm -hmm. beacons on mast arms at that location instead of having, having those just the, the signal lights up there. So that's a little more expensive, especially if you have to do mast arms. We would not recommend that at this time. Maybe wait for the, the full um, improvement recommendations for the, the whole study area. So, um, and then in pavement lighting. I've not seen these um, on a public facility. I've seen these in parking lots quite a bit where you actually have lights in the, the street themselves, you know, where it yeah. kind of shines on the crosswalk. So. Um, but this is something else that you know, could be a little more expensive and that, that becomes a maintenance issue. Um, Rainwater, things like that getting in there could be um, a problem trying to keep maintenance on that con continuously. So we would not recommend that treatment at this time either. Um, potential future considerations. So um, looking at this, and this is, could probably be something that will be included maybe in their full recommendations, but um, option one would be a Z crossing. So this is something we have at GTCC on South Main Street where you have the median island in, but you you do it in a way that pedestrians have to face traffic, right? So they, you turn that Z crosswalk either way, you're actually facing traffic and see you know, the movement of vehicles and things like that. So uh, that's you know, obviously a little more expensive. You have the cost there of 35,000 to $65,000. So, um, and then um, our final option here would be just to install a full traffic signal at that location. Um, so that's your most expensive option. And again, that may be something that comes out in the full recommendations, but um, you are fairly close to Lexington um, current signal already, but um, that would be, you know, obviously very expensive, you know, two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars depending on, you know, what you want you wanted to do out there. So, um, again, all of these recommendations, like we talked about before, this is a state maintained facility, so anything that we do out there would have to be uh, approved by NCDOT as well. So, so in summary, we have the uh, the the cost here of some of our recommendations. So the enhanced lighting. $5,000 uh, existing, enhance the existing RFB, double posted those, $25,000. The Refuge Island, $15,000, with a total cost of about $45,000 for implementation. So, um, again, you know, the feasibility and additional alternatives as, as part of the great, Greater Main Street Corridor. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at different things. How do we slow speeds? I mean, we've been out there. Um, you know, how do you get people to pay attention to those things? Um, and how do we slow speeds, and what do we want Main Street to look like in the future? So that's the overall, kind of what the overall study, the comprehensive yeah. study will look at. So uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions. I've got some questions. Sure. Okay. All right, so can you get back to the slide right before this one? Which one? Okay, uh, no, not that one. This, uh, not that one. No, back to, towards the end. The other way. One more, one more. Okay, there. All right, down, down on option two at the bottom. Yep. So these cars, like heading 
it looks like, uh, well, I don't know if they're heading, I guess they're heading southbound. It's like a blue, pink, green. What are those cars doing? Are they traveling or are they parked? So this is just a, they just put that intersection in there. That's not typical of what's out there. It doesn't represent what's out there now. So that would be like on street parking. Okay. But that's just okay. showing. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. And what, maybe what, what they're trying to represent there is you basically would have, it'd be a signal. So you'd have crosswalks on either side right. of the signal. So you, okay. So, so my point is, I don't, in my opinion, and remember, I work for traffic. No, I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> you know, so in my opinion, and I love that. That looks awesome. And it costs a lot of money. So here's a couple of things I'm thinking. And I don't know if this is doable. One is if we could do some kind of ordinance that does not allow through 18-wheeler through traffic. Like the 18-wheelers can only come through if they're making a delivery. And then two, as far as on-street parking, and we've talked about this for eight years, you, if you did designated times that could allow and it could really just do some painting, I feel like instead of waiting all these months, we've got specifically from Lexington to Ferris. And of course, I care all about Maine and, and that specific mm -hmm. portion isn't even in my ward, but there's a lot of private investments made in that area. That is the area that we are struggling to help make into a, a second social district. So, you know, these private investors have been there for years. I go to Sweet Old Bills and, and Brown Truck a lot. My dog loves going there. And it is scary. I mean, it is literally scary. And to keep waiting, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anywhere, like, I don't know what, how our, what our feelings are towards Rumpel. Rumble strips? Is that how you call it? Rumble strips? Mm -hmm. I've seen those used in cities. Like, what about, and I understand also, okay, so you're coming down, heading south from, from Main Street. You pass Lexington. There's a, it's a downhill. So you're trying to beat that light. You're in a downhill. I mean, I see that it's the perfect storm. Um, but the cro a crosswalk is not going to be enough. I think we're going to have to do some designated on-street Parking. I think that we can even mm -hmm. do it as like a pilot project. I wish we could even start it like the summer uh, as like a pilot project on street designated times and see kind of what, what that does. And then what about, have you seen in other cities like ordinances where 18 wheelers cannot use drive through? Yeah, there's, there's areas and there's things in different uh, cities <laughs> ordinances that you know, limit you know, truck traffic. Uh, no, no truck route, uh, no trucks allowed, things like that. Okay. Um, given that Main Street is a, a major thoroughfare and there is um, a lot of businesses that are located through there, I'm not sure that might be a little difficult, but that's something we can always look at. I mean, yeah. um, moving forward, we can take a look and see if we can, uh, you know, push traffic. And, and obviously, you know, we have I-74, ways to get around Main it, Street. Absolutely. Right? So the thing is, how do you get people to stop using Main Street to try to use these, these other facilities that, um, you know, to can bypass and get those trucks away. So right. um, the thing is, and you're right, the Main Street is it's the most direct point, you know, north to south through town, and, and people are going to use that, truckers are going to use that. It's, it's hard to, you know, stop them from doing that. But um, there are ways that we can look at doing that, um, potentially with signage and yeah. ordinance and things like that. Because specifically, like Walmart 18-wheelers, I see them a lot. So we've got the Walmart up in North Main, we've got yeah. the Walmart down on South Main. Mm -hmm. you, can do, you can do the 68 can take you down there, yep. 74. So but until we say no, they're gonna yeah. keep doing it. Yeah. So I wish we could say no. <laughs> and y'all yeah, know me, I'm that. always, how do we get to a yes? <laughs> now I wanna say, how can we get to a no? Yeah, right. and, and, and to follow up on, on uh, Councilwoman Peters' uh, remarks, I, the 18 wheelers and how we sort of look at how they're getting where they need to go, how many businesses right in that area need 18 wheelers. Right. I imagine that takes a little more time and could be it would. a part of that bigger study, I imagine. Yeah. Um, I'm leaning in a little bit more, though, with Councilman Peters on the parking part, though. Yeah. I know that's a struggle because folks have said there's so many cut-ins right yeah. there where people have to... It's, it's, it's not as cut and dry yeah. as what we did on English at yeah. County Yards and Cohab. And, and we're early enough in the study as far as the truck traffic that we can have them look at that, too. I mean, they can look at that as part of the recommendations. Um, from the bigger study, of how we treat those that truck yeah, traffic. So, yeah. So, so to the parking part, though, I, I, I'm with Councilman Peters. I think so. I was in a conversation either last week or the week before last, where someone just said, "Hey, you know, at what point are you guys going to approve a social district for that area?" Yeah. And I said, quite frankly, 
I don't, I don't think you'd ever get a vote from me on that until we see some drastic changes right there. Yeah. Because, like, and someone said, well, couldn't you just do Sweet Oak, Bills, Brown Truck, and BBJs? I said, you could, but then what about all those other ones that are right there in that same vicinity? Right. There's, there's, they're all right there where, where they all want to be a part of that. And mm -hmm. same way I felt similarly about the other one, I feel a lot strong, uh, a lot more strong about this one because we see folks get hit at that crosswalk, yeah. at yeah. that crosswalk. Um, and it's, you, you just got so much pedestrian traffic in there. Whatever we can do to get that slowed down I yeah, mean, there are going to be some some larger recommendations out of that study. So we we've looked at this. You guys are aware we looked at this in the past, yeah. um, twenty fourteen. And how do we handle that traffic if we if we reduce lanes or put parking out there? You know, we have twenty thousand vehicles a day on Main Street. So how do we handle that at, at the intersections or on either side of that? Are you going to have you know will traffic be backed up? You know, down Main Street once it gets to that point at Lexington, where does that traffic go at that point? Um, but before uh, some of the neighborhoods on either side, you have historical area, Johnson Street, uh, Hillcrest. How do you, do you push that traffic that way? And I think the larger question is how do we get it off before that, like we talked about, yeah. and having that traffic go around yeah. um, before you get to that point. So, um, yeah, that's definitely, yeah, signage, and I think it's, yeah. you know, on-street parking, um, you know, more pedestrian friendly is, is always good in my eyes. So, um, you know, we can, we can work with that and just, we want to make sure that we don't impact or negatively impact um, the automobile as well. I mean, that sounds uh, a little bit crazy, but yeah, I mean, people want to, they'll start complaining, right? If traffic starts backing up, um, you guys will get calls <laughs> as well. So, so what you, I will, I will say we are, uh, the manager and Greg and I are working on a plan for that on street parking for certain times, weekends, okay. at evening. So we are a, a, a test. Kind of a test market for okay, that. Well, so it is, yeah. it is a all conversation and yeah. vote on because hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll have something to bring to yeah. you to discuss on that. But that is big okay, problem. like at another PL? Yeah. And it's okay. and when do we think that, that will come up to another PL? <laughs> it's well, always I mean, that it's we're here talking about transportation road, so. today. Yeah. yeah. I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll leave it open to we, we'll get you a date, but we yeah. don't have an estimate right now. Okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then this is a real naive question and I don't even know, but so how like GPS works. So at what point, I guess, I guess, I don't know if cities give, how, how GPS kind of comes up with their data. But, you know, at some point, if, if something's happening on a street, it's a permanent fixture, a GPS will automatically tell you a different route. Is that right? I mean, I don't really mm, know. How to, I think it just looks for the, the closest, the most direct route. And if, okay. yeah. if that, if it's updated, I'm sorry. If, I think it's a, if it's updated that that route is no longer viable, right. they will redirect it. But wouldn't the city have to update the GIS to to say that this route is no longer usable before Global GPS would redirect them permanently? Uh, yeah. Good morning, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, so, so yes, sort of. Um, if there's going to be a permanent change to a roadway or even an extended temporary change. So, for example, when now Salem Parkway, but Business 40 was closed for that construction, yeah. um, the state and the city at, at Winston-Salem at the time reached out to Google Maps and others and let them know that there's going to be a permanent, you know, or a, or a long-term temporary change to this, and then it, it rerouted that. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, we can be proactive and reach out and make those changes, or uh, depending on the application that you're using, like Waze, yeah. the users will identify that, and that will send the information in. But if it, if it becomes, uh, say, in the future when the city is able to implement changes along uh, Main Street, if, it, um, if it's permanent enough and has enough of an effect, we can let the, the, um, the application companies know and then they'll make that as part of their permanent thing. And then it will redirect you to say, hey, you're welcome to go down Main Street and High right. Point if you want, but it's not going to be your quickest route. Right. You should go 68 or, mm, or 73 or 74 to yeah. get around that. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Anything further? No, just a uh, final question. Um, we, would have to, we would have to draft an ordinance and come up with a transportation plan to to, to do that before we move forward with any change in direction. If you wanted to do a temporary? Yeah, temporary to permanent yeah. uh, redirect. Yeah, I think okay. I would think so. And then, of course, DOT would have to weigh okay. in on that because, right. Right. Um, and the first thing they're going to say, we heard this yesterday, is um, that's fine if you guys want to take over maintenance for that, that roadway, right? Yeah. So we can do what we want, but 
that's a, that's a bigger question. It's always, it's always the trade off. Right. Well, and that's a, that'll be a decision for the committee and the council to make. And we'll, we'll provide all that information on what the maintenance costs will be and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And, uh, and, and we'll do our best if, you know, when the state listens to this meeting, uh, you know, <laughs> after the fact, uh, to, to get them to work with us to keep it on their maintenance yeah. as much as possible. Right. But uh, there, there just comes a point, and we'll, yeah. we'll be happy to present all that yeah. information. Right. And well, they're, they're involved. The DOT is involved in, in the uh, study there on the uh, committee, so they can, they're aware of everything that we're but, but hypothetically, if we redirect those heavy vehicles off of that street, it ultimately should bring down maintenance costs in the future, right? Could be, yeah. Could so, be, yeah. so it could be, it could ultimately be affordable to to take this on if we have to then take on some of the cost of this to 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 get what we need in terms of public safety, walkability, future use of that social district, and then also redirect some of that more dangerous track traffic off it may ultimately shake out in the cost analysis if we yeah. if we look at that potentially yeah I, i'll just put it on the table and y'all y'all are tired of hearing from me i know about this <laughs> i don't think any of these solutions are going to work i mean i think it's going to be a waste of money to put we could put 500 yellow yeah. lights at the brown truck crossing cars don't stop for yellow lights yeah. it's just Yellow light means slow down, beat the red light, but if you have a yellow light, their cars are gonna go through. If we don't change that light to a red light, we're wasting our money. So, I mean, that's, that's my bottom line. If we put a red light where there's a yellow light, problem solved. But we can't do that, can we? All right, DOT does not like that treatment. Um, there's, there are places in the state where they have them, very few. Uh, I think a couple of locations, one down at, uh, I think one at Appalachian State, one at the coast. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they do not recommend, they would recommend a full signal oh, ahead of doing that. Full signal in. Yeah. That's if, the, yes sir, Chairman, that if, if um, that, that's acceptable to the state and it is, it is you know, recommended, of course, you know, staff re would realizes that that would be um, the ultimate fix. Um, Gosh, I think that would be mean, terrible. Could we not just a, I think that. to put a red light there would be terrible. Why? I mean, and, and keep everything else the same. Two lanes going, you know, both ways and everything else the same, but just put a red light there. Why would it not work? Okay, because then you're going to stop there. Then you're going to have all these cars stopped right in front of an area that you're trying to make pedestrian friendly. We, we've talked about, even you've said... We, several times about on-street parking. Why don't we do on-street parking? I would rather you, you say, I will, we can paint those today. Absolutely, I would okay, love well to have on-street parking. Now there's this red light coming. I, a red light, I, I've never- I don't mean a red light that is not activated. I mean a pedestrian activated crossing signal. Right. We have a yellow crossing signal right uh, now. We'll make well, that I, crossing signal a red stop. I gotcha, I gotcha. And say traffic stop. Okay, yeah. pedestrians cross. Traffic goes back. I mean, I, I, to yeah. me, this is this is the part. This is the frustrating part of working with government. That's an easy fix, but it's not. I mean, I, I, I still can't get that mm. easy fix. Well, why? Why? And why? Why can't we do that? So it, it, it's an NCDOT, NCDOT facility. So they would have to approve that treatment. They don't approve that treatment. Just, you know, just like I said, it's only at a few locations, uh, and then I think they're trying to get those removed. Um, I think it's on maybe Highway 12 or something at Nags Head where you cross there at the sand dunes and things like that. But um, they would just prefer to see, if you're gonna, driver behavior, even if you see that red light, um, I don't think that's gonna help. I think drivers are gonna still probably run that um, just because of driver behavior. They see it's not a full signal. Um, unless you, the other thing is enforcement, right? I mean, that's the, that's the one thing that's gonna help with some of that too. Um, but uh, NCDOT, they just prefer, if you're gonna put something in where you're stopping traffic with that, they'd rather have it to be a full signal. Well, why don't we invite Mike Fox and Archer Wright to come have a beer at Brown Truck? Maybe, I mean, they've got, I, they've worked with me really, really well. I mean, who at NCDOT is saying no? I mean, have you talked yeah. to Mike or Archer? I, well, yeah, we've talked to, we've discussed it, and that's where I got my information. That's who we talked to. Uh, there is a safety office that uh, NCDO2 has two divisions in our area, Division 7 and Division 9. So they have a safety group that looks at things like this constantly. They're, they're always looking at different uh, problems, issues, concerns uh, with safety like this, and, and they're the ones that said they would not recommend that. They would recommend 
um, a full signal there uh, in the future. Well, if we can I still think the on-street parking would make a, a huge difference, even if we didn't have the red light. I think on-street parking and a full crossing signal right there and bike lanes and all kinds of things, more landscaping, there's lots we can do. Yeah. If we put a full signal right there, let's put it in next month. And why, why can we recommend that? Can we go that route? That's, we, can we, yes, sir, so, Chairman and members of the committee, we, we can. Staff will, um, uh, if, that's a, if that's how you'd like to proceed, um, we'll just have to find the, the, the funding and get the approval through uh, NCDOT. I think uh, these are great could, options. I don't think yeah. they're going to work. And, could, could, and it, it, it would could not. We I mean, it was, a, could we do as a, as a trial? I mean, and and maybe not incur call. I, mean, I don't know what. Like a pilot would, project. I don't know how. Like I don't know how project. we would do that as a yeah. you know as an interim uh, as a trial yeah. period for a yeah. signal. Yeah, it'd be. And we have some technical work that we need to do uh, as far as the timing of the signal right. be related because of its proximity to to Lexington. Yeah. So you're, yeah. To the to the committee members' point earlier, uh, you know that. Because they're so closely, yeah. uh, you know, positioned, um, there there would be some timing issues there. Right. But it so, wouldn't be a timed signal; it would be an activated signal, which makes it all the more. I mean, it's already an activated signal. Us. We're not changing anything. Oh well, if if it's a pedestrian activated, um, so to to the point, if it was just a red light, and you come up to the to the pedestrian crossing and you and you turn that red. Um, unlike a normally timed, you know, intersection, which would be tied into our signal system, right? Um, you've now created a red light, even though it's not a normal signal, at an intersection that's very close to a signalized intersection. So yeah. that kind of throws the whole flow of things off because it's a how system. How is that different than what we already have? Because we have a push button Correct. that activates a signal that says. Stop. Traffic stop. It, it does, but it, stop. but it doesn't do it. If you notice, sometimes you have to stand there and wait for a, a, what seems what can feel like forever for that pedestrian signal to allow you. Um, but that's because the whole system behind the scenes is making sure that, that, that those timings line up correctly. So that's, that's, the, that's the difference. That's a signal timing thing. Um, it, but we can, we can handle that. We, we do that. And we have we can make know, professional staff that, that does yeah. that, and, and we control those things, um, even on behalf of the state yeah. along Main Street. So that, 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 that's just something we have to do from, from the technical side, but it's not that big of a deal. And it would provide what we're ultimately looking for, right? It's not to get the pedestrian across the street as yeah. quickly as possible. It's to get them across the street as safely as possible. Safely. And so, you and know, we, we've talked about um, the safety of the intersection of that, that crosswalk, you know. Uh, We've, we've done some research on that. We've pulled accident data, and to our knowledge, there's only been, I think, one um, that I can recall accident there. Now, that doesn't mean that it's, it's safe. Right? I mean, you still have, to I think, define accident. You mean well, I think a pedestrian was hit. I, I, can, right? I can tell you of so, five. Okay. Because I mean, if to they're not reported, they're not reported. Right. right. I mean, it's reported. That, that's reported, right? So we don't know if right. it's not reported. Right. But reported right. accident where a pedestrian was struck, uh, we, we have one. So... Um, you know, we can look into that a little deeper and see, but again, I think it's going to slow those speeds down. You have cars on Main Street that do. I mean, it's it's a speed issue as well. So, okay. So, Chairman, I guess I guess what we need from the committee is, you know, what your preference is moving forward. Staff staff's recommendation was based on, you know, we have a full study that will be done, uh, or at least to the public comment uh, uh, portion here and and council's work session in the summer. Um, to do these these immediate. However, if the if the will of the committee is otherwise, we're happy to uh, pursue other options. So we just we need some direction from from you and the committee. Okay. My my thought is, if we do these, we're still going to be coming back here in six months saying that it doesn't work. I, I want to stop. I want a stop light there. Whatever we need to do to have a red light, a yellow light. But in whatever configuration, the yellow light is not working. So I think we need a full stop red light there. And I'd also like to see if we can do some kind of, you know, pilot project for the for the summer, you know, some kind of temporary thing that we can see if it works. You know, like this Saturday, we're going to have the first social district Saturday with the trolley and on. I hope some folks maybe from transportation can just kind of be out mm -hmm. there just to kind of look and, and, and see what's happening. Um, for on-street uh, parking? Are you talking on-street yeah, parking? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, yeah, I think for on-street parking, I think that, 
you know, and it's not about how many cars are actually going to be able to park, which I understand like all the different, you know, it, it's more about slowing down the traffic. And, and I'm so sorry if I sound frustrated because I am so grateful to all, you guys are awesome. But I'll tell you what, you know, being out there and I mean, I'm a nervous wreck with people and their children because one little step, I mean, those, and I've, I've taken videos back in 2014, hiding in the bush at John Pollan's place of these cars. It's like a highway. And I guess it is a highway. It's 311. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I, I just know that there's other highways that goes through towns. I know that they're different than High Point, And I get that. But, you know, we want to be pedestrian friendly. We want to have these social districts. We want Brown Truck and Sweet Old Bills and Frady's and everyone to succeed. And the only way that we're going to do that is if we say we got to do this and so yeah i mean if uh, if the manager's office is agreeable to it and we've done this before with the, the holiday stroll right we've closed the lane in each direction the curb lane um, now it was just on the weekend so traffic is is a little less so um, but moving forward if that's something we want to look at for a, an interim improvement you know just to like you said see how it works um, we could get dot approval and if manager's office is okay with it looking at something doing like that and keeping it that more long term than just you know, we're, we're going to look at, we're going to get some, some traffic issues and um, some complaints from Main Street, but that's something we can look at. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, absolutely. What, what he said. <laughs> yeah. And we are in the process of already doing that, so we will just, we'll, we'll bring something back for that as well. But I'd like to do the stop. I'd like to pursue that at the same time. But we will come up with a parking plan and schedule. And we are talking about just weekends, pilot program to see how it works. So if that's acceptable to everyone in the committee, I, I would love to see something come back soon for that. Does that need a motion? Uh, I don't I don't believe so. Just a consensus, yeah. right? I'm looking okay. at the, Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's a consensus from the committee, then Jeremy, what staff would do is, um, I'm looking at, at Greg as well. I think we'll bring back, um, we'll do some, some heavier research on what it would take in the time frame to get a signal that's red. So we'll, I'll just leave it at that so that it gives us some wiggle room there. The, the cost implications, how we would fund that and potential for um, what the director just talked about as far as uh, a lane closure, yeah. you know, for, for maybe weekends and events like that to, to pilot what uh, the committee member talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that, if that's, that's the will of the committee, then we'll, we'll carry that forward. Love it. Excellent. Thank you. Love it. Thank you all. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And thank you, Greg. Sure. Thank you for your work on this. Yeah, thanks, Greg. <laughs> Our next item is a, is a discussion about the Catalyst District parking study that we've had. I'm going to go ahead and get started with some of the history of uh, kind of how we got to this parking study. Uh, in 2000. 21, we had uh, some of our developer partners in the Catalyst area start working on parking solutions for their projects. One being the Spring Hill Suites Hotel associated with Cognitive Yards. Um, they commissioned a parking study that was done focusing mainly on what it would take to park their property. Uh, the city had parking studies that have been a, uh, accomplished in the past that focused on the hospital area mainly to, to locate uh, all the parking that was there, which found at that time there was pretty adequate parking around the hospital. But there really hadn't been a comprehensive look at the entire Catalyst area to say, how do you um, bring the parking resources that we have currently together with what we need in the future? And then how do you stagger that as development and redevelopment occurs over time? So in January of 2022, staff really began talking with Kimley Horn about how we could conduct a parking study and, and look at the, the asset that's already out there, which is parking, both on street and in structured parking. City has three decks. So we really recognize we need to take a comprehensive approach, engage stakeholders who were going to make investments. Um, most of the stakeholders had some expectation of public parking in some form being provided, either adjacent or fairly close to their redevelopment opportunities. So I'm going to run through this. I'm going to keep it pretty high level and then really just kind of see if you have questions. You have it. This is the executive summary of a, of a larger document we're going to send out, but this kind of hits the high points. Um, so key goals on the left-hand side, you know, where do you put new parking in this area? Um, how do you manage special events? We knew that at the time soccer was going to be 
coming down the road. Um, how were we currently handling the rockers parking? Was it optimal? And then how do we handle that over time as some of those surface lots go away? Um, how do we t look at the existing on-street and off-street parking program that the city has with those three decks? And then how do we use the plaza garage in particular because it's the closest? You know, do we need to use that for shuttle purposes or how do you do that? So, so they looked at intermediate to midterm, near term, long term, and then just this unknown and tried to start putting these projects in buckets. And we recognize that over time, they're going to move from one bucket to another, but we've got to start putting some methodology, methodology together to address you know, how the city invests. Um, realize early on the key st stakeholders need to be at the table. Um, at that time, there was not a lot of discussion between the stakeholders and the stakeholders in the city, and we were not coordinating our responses to some of these key events. So we said, thought this really is an opportunity to have everybody talking either to each other or to Kimberly Horn and the city. Let's get it on paper and start making some assumptions that we know will change, but move forward with a methodology. So a key project methodology here, just I'm not going to read through those because you, you've got it. And um, But how do the rockers really function today and how Will that area function in the future as development starts? Stakeholders are on the left. Um, everybody participated. It was a, uh, mainly uh, in one day. We had uh, Kimley Horn come in, and these were in person interviews, um, either at Congdon Yards or, I mean, at the uh, stadium or on site at the stakeholders' facilities. So uh, you'll notice a key finding on the right there it, it recognizes the 565 spaces that are in the Elliott sidewalk agreement with the city. So all that information was provided as well. This is what's out there today, and I'm gonna make a couple of notes here. Over the, over the space of the study, two key things occurred that we didn't know would occur. One is the city was able to purchase the Perco property, and the second is the First Baptist Church property came on the market, and the city's currently under um, contract for that property. So those are two things that we did not even foresee at the beginning, but we knew, you know, given the scope of the study, we were fortunate to be able to work those two events into the final analysis. Uh, the Perco property, as I'm going to call it, combined with the Lindsay Street parking lot, uh, will yield about 353 parking spaces, I believe this is. Um, That's assuming that after the city uh, completes the demo of that parking or that building that we'll be able to go in there and put some surface parking that would front on English. So that's a tremendous opportunity, yep. both short term and say in the next nine months to 12 months to get a sizable parking lot out there. And then currently you see there's about 153 spaces at First Baptist Church. So under uh, non-service day parking, opportunities, there's a lot out there for that. Any questions so far on any of the slides? Blue, as you can see, are, are private lots that are scattered around that orange color is, is public, so. I love seeing all the red lines for the proposed on-street parking. So we're, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Early opportunities for what we can do uh, pretty immediately. So I was, I was excited, this slide's up front, not at the very end, but this is, uh, just going through the parking demand, this high point rocker sellout condition. This is this is 4,000 people sitting inside the stadium watching a, a game, and the specific game I believe was NC State versus HPU. I was out that night and saw part of the game, but also saw the parking situation, and we we had adequate parking to park that night, and there was not it was not a problem. I mean, it was it was very doable, but this was. Uh, based on real observations that night. Damon, you have anything to add? add it? If I forget it, let me know. <laughs> Existing conditions, um, early opportunities. We can do up to 129 new on-street parking spaces. I would, I would suggest that we not do all those at one time because it would be duplicative. Um, we don't need to do some on Elm and then tear them up yeah. right away. 
We need to figure out what's going to happen in the timing on the Spring Hill Suites, on that MLK section between there and the, well, it's a showroom or just a outdoor market, but yeah. the, <laughs> the front's there. So um, it's some opportunity uh, there, but certainly we're going to go ahead and look at early implementation of some of these. Just an in internal conversation, they may not be marked with hash marks to delineate. We may take more of the approach like we had over at the Children's Museum where you have a kind of a marked lane because sometimes you can get more space or more cars in that area than if it's all hashed off and, and marked. So it be maybe a combination of that. So there's about 800 public spaces, which is a, a good bit out there right now. Can you find that one to round it out? Seven ninety nine. Yeah, we, we could we could probably make it an extra one somewhere. So you know, walk shed is how far people are comfortable walking or want to walk. This gives you a couple of op, you know some data that we didn't have. So part of this exercise was let's get all this data in one place. If there's things that we don't have, let's let's collect it. Let's start looking at this as an asset that has to be managed over time, and the factors are going to change. But you got to set. Uh, the data at some point to move forward. So I'll this is. I to say that my wife and I live up here on that map, and plenty of people on our street walk to those ball games. So yeah. a mile is not, I mean, that's not out of the question anymore for walkability. Yeah. Yeah, this is the two and four yeah. minute walk. So, so summary here, where do we go from here? Um, this is a great, um, this, this is one of the charts that kind of make me say, hey, this is pretty cool. It's going to change. This is based on assumptions, but this is factoring in all the different things that can happen over time as we lose surface lots, as we potentially gain structured parking. Um, you see the assumption there is it's going to cost about $24,000 of space to build structured parking. Uh, that's a lot. Um, we don't need 1,600 spaces today, and it may be a long time before we need 1,600 spaces. So we're not suggesting, nor is Kimberly Horn, that you go out and start doing that immediately. That's how do you look at this area over a long-term period? Um, but the key thing is putting the investment in the right place. And that was you know, kind of the, one of the main drivers. Um, there's two ways to approach it. You know, the, low, the low end is the city only builds a minimal number and the other end, which we don't recommend, is you know, let's go build everybody parking. Well, we're not gonna be able to afford that. So some of the recommendations, the, the quick stuff we've already talked about, the on street, we're gonna evaluate how many we put in and how quickly, and then use our two new properties smartly. Um, church Street, uh, that parking at the church there will be incorporated into public parking. And then English Road Garage, which is shown on here, really will be another surface lot. So we'll, we'll get to design that fairly soon. The recommendation for the two new garages, you know, it's going to depend on who goes first. Um, we want to be responsive to Cognon Yards, to Peter's development, to L8 Sidewalk, to other opportunities that might happen along Lindsay. Um, but the city needs to be nimble and have the data to move forward. Special events, um, we're going to get to that in just a second. So here it is, this paved English Street service lot. Um, add the on street parking, figure out on Church Avenue parking, you know, what can we do there? What would that look like in conjunction with the city hall? Um, the private partners that are around there, you know, try to nail down their development schedules as best we can. And then it comes to this, which we have free courtesy parking citywide. We really need to reconsider if that's the model that we want to use moving forward. Um, it's easier than it's ever been to have a small charge for on street parking and you know it's signage in an app. Mm -hmm. um, there's very few beach communities that don't have a parking charge. Um, we are going to be investing a lot of money in a parking facility so that's one way to pay for it. it when we do that however and we consider it we're going to have to look at the entire 
downtown, the market area as well. Um, so that's kind of where we need to go next is philosophically, if there's the desire to look at the entire downtown area and what it would look like and how we could institute paid on-street parking, we would need some direction to do that. And just kind of to wrap it up, soccer is going to start 2024. Um, the parking is there. They took a look at that and uh, we'll be able to accommodate soccer. So. Thank you. Next question. Great job. But I do agree on the uh, charging, getting the app to charge for the on-street parking. No one has free parking. No. So I think that that was a good, and it doesn't have to be a lot. We can start real low and then as we grow, you know, but start getting people used to it. So. And that's kind of a change in the mentality of development now as you, you know, you look at Chupistas and these people that think that downtown development starts with parking and then you do everything else. But if you, if you have free parking, it means you can go anytime and it's easy, but it's not worth much. You know, once you start paying for your downtown, you say, wow, this is something worth having. So I, well, I, I totally it, agree with And you. it's not free. Somebody's paid for it at some point. Yeah, so yeah. it did just magically pop up. So. Well, I think, I think future financing flexibility, uh, if we recoup what we, what our expenditures on, on the major parking, if we can do that, that gives us future financial flexibility in terms of what we can do to fund major projects. Um, I, I was looking at the one slide where it had the private parking uh, outline. I think it was in dark blue. Uh, yeah, so that's, those are, those are businesses with private, with parking spaces currently. So those are the total private spaces and a number of those are under agreement with the Rockers, so the Rockers can use them on game night. Okay, so, so Dr. Peters has a good number of those, and I think there might have been a slide. That, that's what I was going to ask: is if there's some type of agreement, um, you know, with our Catalyst District that those spaces can be utilized in those off hours of business or whatever it may be, um, just to have that space available. And if not, if there's something that we can you know, reach out to them and work out and, and, and have that available for public use during those uh, those busy, busy times downtown. Yeah, no, and wait, just to, just to give a little elaboration on it, the way it's working right now is most of the parking for games is clustering north of the stadium in those medical office yeah, buildings yeah. that are empty after five o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Peters and others own a lot of those and they've agreed with the Rockers to let them use it and they have an arrangement that as that redevelopment occurs or it may not occur it, those are pretty established mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. facilities um it may displace some of that parking but as you can see on the south side there's a lot of opportunity and if, even east of lindsay there's a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. so as that changes over time we just have to manage it and this document and the methodology gives us some framework to yeah. do that I will add that having free parking also allows somebody to park in front of a business for 10 hours at a time yeah. while they go to work somewhere else. And if you do have on-street parking for one hour limit, it, it changes those spaces up so that you can actually go to the businesses and use those businesses and create a walkable environment, which is our goal. Go ahead. Yeah, Jeremy, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, uh, it creates turnover. Mm -hmm. so the, and sometimes employees will take advantage yeah. Of free parking, so you're right. They, they'll they'll park in front of the, the very business that they want to attract people to, mm -hmm. and uh, so. But we're I don't know if we're necessarily at that point yet, and we could look at it you know, from certain district aspects. And, and Greg and I, you know, as, as we start moving toward that, um, yeah, that consideration for all of you, um, that'll that'll all be included in there. Yeah. Certainly, those areas like church, that parking is such a premium, and there's the whole the entire block is is yeah. walk up business so those are premium spots so I, I would like to see what we can what we can do to have some turnover so what what do you need from us will this come to full council or will you what we're going to do we're going to send out the entire study to you but we wanted today to highlight kind of the key takeaways um 
I don't know that we need to put it on the council agenda for a presentation. I think if there's interest in specific questions, would ask that you let us know, or if the full council desires to present it publicly, we can do that. But we just wanted to get it to you guys and, and then send it out to the rest of the council. The other thing that's gonna happen this week, we will release it to the key stakeholders. Um, we've had some conversations with several of those just to make sure we had the facts right and there were no inconsistencies in here. So they've looked at it and kind of fact checked it, but it'll go out this week to all those stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. That's awesome information. Anything further? Anything further from the dice? If not, thank you.